My name is Mike Wallace, and I'm the executive director uh, at Theatre Museum Canada. I'm also, um, I guess for two more days, a member of the Local Arrangements Committee and the Programming Committee for the conference. Welcome. Uh, and also I'd like to welcome our panelists. So they make sure you're in the right room. Collapsing silos, building communities, glam sector collaborations. Cavan? Caven. Caven, sorry. Caven Baker Vokes is a former member of the Parliamentary Press Gallery and has uh, volunteered or worked in several Ontario museums and heritage organizations. He holds a, an honors BA in political science and Canadian studies and an MA in European, Russian and Eurasian studies from Carleton University. He has researched, lived and worked in several countries including Russia, China, Uzbekistan, Turkey and Latvia. Presently he is nearing completion of a museum study certificate from the OMA. Michael Rickley Lancaster studied fine arts at Fanshawe College and has a diploma in applied museum studies from Algonquin College. He was assistant curator at the Diefenbunker Museum and a program coordinator for Young Canada Works in heritage organizations with the CMA. He's also been a board member with heritage organizations throughout the Ottawa area and has served as an executive director, curator of the Mississippi Valley Textile Museum since 2007. Michael's a board member of the OMA and on two of the task forces, looking ahead Ontario Museums 2025, and more recently, the Renewed Museum Funding Model Task Force. Uh, Carrie Badgley is, uh, Ontar is, the, is Ontario Library Association's 2018 president. He's received a BA from Trent University and an MA and PhD from Carleton University, all in Canadian history. Uh, he served as editor, journal of the Canadian Historic Asso Association, and is published in an areas of social and political history and archival theory. He currently co-edits Inside OBLA. Carrie previously served as an archivist at LAC, Libraries and Archives Canada, and in 2005 he joined the Canadian Food Inspect Inspection Agency, where he is currently manager of ATIP. And finally, Lisa Snyder is currently the Archean... Uh, I always read... I've never heard it say it. Is that the way you pronounce it? Archeon. Archeon. All right. Great. I've read it on the screens, so but never actually said it aloud. Uh, currently the uh, Archean Coordinator for Archives Association of Ontario and Memory BC Coordinator for the Archives Association of British Columbia. Lisa has been a digital archivist since 2010 and has worked at archives such as Canadian Museum for Human Rights, the Harry Ransom Centre at the University of Texas at Austin and Brock University. Lisa was a professional web developer for over 17 years and is internationally recognized expert on archival accessibility for people accessibility for people with disabilities. Please join me in welcoming them and having our panel discussion. So we're going to uh, do this a little bit different than other panels that, uh, that you may have been to. We're taking a, a bit of a page out of the journalist's sort of a handbook and using a set of questions, well, first articles or things that are within the media or are part of discussions, and using that as a question to pose to our panelists. And one of the major points of this whole session is to end up getting you engaged as the audience to end up having you end up asking questions. We may not end up getting through all of this, but my hope is that we'll end up getting through a lot of these sorts of questions. They are challenging. Uh, they are issues that we all face, uh, whether we're in museums, whether or not we're in archives, whether we're in libraries. And our hope is that uh, we start to end up getting you to all think about how you can end up interacting with your own, uh, within your own community uh, amongst these organizations. So, First off, why collaborate? Well, at least at the moment, within the, uh, within the world that we're living in, we're seeing more and more people who want to end up having access to the information that we have. And that we have all this siloed sort of organization. So basically, this, this summarizes, I think, a lot of how the public, at least, perceives and wants to end up interacting with our sources. Um, this is actually fairly germane in terms of how we actually came about this as a panel itself. Um, that this came out of a discussion between myself and Lisa back in, I think it was January, and it was on the fact that uh, as I was trying to do research uh, for, for my MA, I was having problems accessing all these different groups and all these different sections, and it was because they were all 
blocked off and separate. Fortunately, I had actually worked in some of these places, so I could actually navigate it. But if you were a researcher, you would be totally cut off. Never mind if you were a person who wanted to just access some of this as a person who was just genuinely interested. So, as part of that, we need to end up being able to break down some of this. And fortunately, uh, we ended up having uh, exactly that sort of idea of a discussion that's going on within within the community. In 2016, there was actually a conference that was held in Ottawa, um, and it came out with the so-called Ottawa Declaration. And it basically said that we're going to increase some of the collaboration between our institutions, we're going to network more locally, nationally, and end up creating more of these sorts of partnerships. Um, and we're going to end up developing more innovative programs, services, adapt some of the technology, and we're going to be able to expand and access more of the collections and ensure that all of us are able to contribute and access and so that we can end up ultimately helping the public good. At least that was, that's the idea or the hope that, uh, that they had coming out of the summit. Um, this is actually part of a worldwide trend that they're seeing. Uh, within the U.S., they actually have it um, brought in as part of legislation. And so you're seeing uh, this, and, and it's not just within the U.S., but it's other places as well where they are housing these things. And if you want to end up having access to grant money and et cetera, you have to be able to end up collaborating uh, amongst our institutions. And um, as a result, we end up having, like I said, the, the U.S. is probably one of the better examples of that. Uh, but within my own little research of just looking at some of these sorts of questions, you end up seeing it pop up within the U.K. and other places where the funding itself is being actually grouped together. So this actually leads to our first question for our panelists, which is, how does your sector or organization that you're involved in collaborate now? Does it? Why and why not? And I'm going to just uh, get Lisa to, to start off and uh, <coughs> to see if what, uh, from an archivist or perspective, how exactly you end up dealing with this. Sure. Um, I'm with the Archives Association of Ontario. They're my boss, so I'm representing them today. And uh, thanks. F uh, it's funny how one conversation, you know, uh, begets a panel, begets a, everybody talking, which is awesome. Because our organization has been talking about um, collaborating with museums and libraries, particularly in the last two years, uh, more and more. Archivists, we work in museums and libraries as well as archives. So sometimes we're in there, you don't know we're in there because we're sometimes in the basement. Uh, we're like mushrooms sometimes. But, but we collaborate because we work with, with myself, I've worked in two museums and, with, and in libraries. So we're always collaborating, except if we're in like a corporate archives or something where we're just us. And I represent Archeon, which is a website for our institutional members to use. Um, they can use it for free. So they, we've got over 50,000 descriptions in there. And that can be from museums, libraries, and archives. So Archeon's kind of a neat thing because it brings everybody together. Um, even though we're an archives association, I've got people from, I've got archives in basements and I've got archives in the provincial archives. I've got library archives, I've got museum archives. And we've got about 183 institutions using Archeon. So all, I like to say that all the cats are in a box, right? And I'm the one who has to do the cat herding. But everybody's from, from somewhere different. So actually, we've been collaborating for quite a long time, which is interesting. And now we're starting to come out more to say, hey, what else? You know, maybe professional development or conferences or try to get more uh, collaboration there. So, um, and this panel too, this is a, a great example of it, that my board was thrilled. They're like, oh, take thousands of pictures. We're going to put this on social media. Like, they're just thrilled that I'm here today. Thank you. Carrie? Well, I, th I think from our sector, from the library sector in particular, there has long been an understanding that we collaborate with local cultural institutions, galleries, archives, museums. Uh, I think the issue has always been that it's ad hoc, mm. that there is really no common understanding of what that collaboration means and what kinds of resources need to be dedicated to it. And part of that is just a, largely a function of the nature of our institutions. For those who live in Toronto, Metro Reference Library, Metro Library, 
you have people who would be dedicated toward you know, collaboration and outreach or fundraising or for this or for that. Um, you have to take a look at Ontario as a whole and there's an awful lot of rural areas where the CEO basically runs everything. So in addition to fostering those kinds of collaborations, they're worrying about salary, they're worrying about disgruntled clients, they're worried about kids dealing drugs in the washroom, they're dealing with a whole bunch of different things in addition to the collaboration. And I think what we can do at the central level with the OLA is start to provide some guidance and some standards and some understandings of the benefits of those kinds of collaborations. And I mean, as I say, it has been a very long standing one. I'll just, well, before passing this over, I was doing some research for something else and I came across an article about uh, the opening of a new library in Collingwood in 1910. And they went out to local artists and they had you know, their artwork. And they were celebrating actually the First Nations in that area. This is 1910. And, and with some artifacts. And so there's a lot of collaboration that was even taking place in 1910. And I, I just, I, I want to editorialize before, be, if we don't run out of, Please. in case we run out of time. Um, one of the points of the collaboration was understanding that you were not necessarily going to reach uh, an incredibly large audience. And I want to just read a passage from the newspaper article that celebrated it. If only three or four persons should be influenced to take an interest in these matters by what has been done, it would be profitable. And, uh, and have an influence on future generations. So basically they're saying, yeah, a lot of people are going to come into our library and a lot of people are going to look at this and have no impact whatsoever, but if three or four people can do it and understand that this is really important, you've succeeded. Now in our society, which is really ge geared towards metrics and bottom line, I don't know if that would pass, but in 1910 that was just axiomatic. So um, I've been the exec director curator of the Textile Museum now for 11 years and I'm the only em paid employee. So we have a large volunteer core. However, I'm always, always open and, and honest out in the community of going out and reaching out. If there's a project I'm thinking, hmm, this would be a neat idea, I'm talking to as many people as possible to figure out how we can make it happen. And I'm gonna give you an example of a collaboration we did that was extremely successful. What we did is, I had a new board member who used to be a board member on the local library uh, board. He found, he said, you know, years and years ago we digitized the local paper, the Elmont Gazette, over 100, 150 years of this paper. And he said, but they've done nothing with it. So I talked to the librarian, I said, is this true? And we talked about the paper and we talked about the digitization that had happened. And, and he said, oh yeah, and that's about as far as it went. Well, then I decided, well, I'm going to apply for a grant for this. And, and see if we can take it further and put it into a, a readable software so we can have a searchable database online, et cetera. And in the end, it was about a three-year project and we have launched that. Um, and it was a great partnership with the local library and, and the, the positive synergies that have happened since then as well. Um, so now we have the full Gazette online. We, as soon as it got launched, we didn't really even do a big marketing campaign to launch it. It was automatically getting 10,000 hits a month and still is to this day. And that's been about four years now that project has been online. It has not slowed down. There are moments where it's higher than 10,000, but the average or lowest amount is 10,000 a month. So it's also increased our marketing. It's increased our website action, but it's also created a real positive synergy with the library in town because they're also then getting more and more publicity, more and more um, interaction throughout this project as well. Then from that, other things that spawned from it, they, were, they had reduction in uh, space, they wanted to grow and get new books. Well, they had a, one section that was just a textile library. They're like, well, let's move it to your location and we'll share it. So people then use the resource and come to our facility. So another great thing spawned from it and we're still talking about more and more. Uh, but this is how I just automatically work that if there's a project I'm thinking of or if a project comes to my, I look at who can, who in the community or outside the community or what can help me make this project happen. And just as a little plug, um, having seen the library at, uh, at, in Elmont, it is one of the better library collections when it comes to having um, the actual industrial explanation about what, uh, what's actually happened here within Canada. Um, and it gives a lot of actual technical um, readouts in terms of everything from the dyes themselves as well as the, uh, 
um, the actual uh, mechanics of everything. So it's definitely a worthwhile museum, and I, I actually volunteered there, so a um, <laughs> bit of a bias. Um, the next part that I wanted to, to discuss was probably one of the more important out of all, at least for myself, I think all the points that, uh, that we have as, as topics of discussion were important, but uh, one of the ones which I really wanted to, to discuss, and, and I think this nicely leads into it, which is how exactly are our institutions seen? Um, I'm sure most of the people are quite familiar with some of the, um, at least in this room, uh, with the issues surrounding the McDonald's uh, campaign in, uh, in British Columbia. Um, for those who are not, um, this actually nicely sums it up. Uh, this was taken directly from one of the news articles, and this was actually one of the tweets that, uh, that someone from uh, Vernon actually um, responded, and, and it's kind of what set off, actually, uh, the news article itself, um, having now gone in and actually done a little bit more background research on how exactly this, did this actually come to light. Uh, basically, McDonald's had made the um, very direct uh, pitch online that, or not online, but on, ra on the radio, that basically spending $5 uh, for a meal at their restaurant was better than spending at a museum. And um, basically, it, it speaks to a much larger issue that we end up all facing, I think, which is a, one of image, and how exactly is it the public perceives us, especially when you can end up having something like that. They did end up backtracking, um, and I, I don't know what happened to their PR person or their communications, but um, I suspect there was a bit of a backlash uh, internally within the company, but um, it, was, it, it does end up teaching us, at least, something that, that we really have to be concerned about. If, if we are having companies making us such a bold statement, what does that speak to for us in terms of uh, as a community? And so moving along, it's, I want to actually ask you guys, what, what are some of the challenges in organizations and how does it deal, how does your organization deal with the disconnect between the work and the public's understanding? And how might we all collaborate in order to, to overcome this? Oh, I'll take this one first because uh, archivists are invisible. Right. Uh, in, in case some of you have never met an archivist, um, I am one. Um, we keep history safe, right? We preserve it and we provide access to it. And in fact, Archeon, I'll just explain just a titch because I didn't do that in the beginning. That's a website where our members can put up descriptions of archival material as well as digital objects. So PDFs, uh, audio, video, all sorts of stuff. And the problem is like when I go to parties, I go up to people and they go, oh, what do you do, right? Your name and then what do you do? And then I say, oh, I'm an archivist. <laughs> and the fear in the eyes is quite amazing. Because uh, they're going, okay, did she say activist? Did she say architect? Uh, and, and some people just stop and then they walk away. And then others will be brave and go, uh, what did you just say? So for us, it's tough because we're in the basements. We're, you know, we don't, have, we don't see light usually because it hurts our materials. And we're, we're invisible. I like to say that, you know, we're the stealth bomber of, you know, libraries, museums, and archives um, because we're not seen. And our profession was always very, uh, introverted like we would never go out and say hey come see us you know because we have to protect the materials so for libraries and museums y'all are going hey come see us come on in we want you to come in whereas archivists have always traditionally been oh stay away <laughs> you know because then we got to give you the materials and then we got to worry about them now that's changing in our profession a lot we do a lot of outreach um, and we do a lot of digitization as well. And so uh, even with Archeon, like there's a, ton, there's a lot of digital objects on there. And I get emails from everybody you can imagine from every different country saying either, where can I, can I use this? Or my grandfather is this, or my grandmother. And you've, you know, I, I, I want to get a hold of this because you know, it's my family. So for us, it's harder because we want to get people to see us, but we don't at the same time. We're like a cat, right? We're not the dog, we're, we're the cat going, I want to go out. No, I don't, I want to stay in. 
So um, it, it's harder for us, but I find with, um, with our work with, with digital materials, I, I'm a digital archivist, that's what I focused on. With that, we're starting to branch out more and more and more and go out to functions and be in conferences and that sort of thing. So for us, it's really tough because not everybody knows who we are, what we do, and then, but they'll know a library, because almost every, well, not today, maybe, but most kids would have a librarian in their life to, to some degree, and probably have gone to a local museum. But in archives, you know, it's tougher. So for us, it's tougher, and, and I'm not sure how we, um, we collaborate. Uh, I think just, just getting known more in the museum and library world and coming to conferences like this, um, we help ourselves, right? Because we get out there more with, with you guys, and then maybe you can, if you're at a party and, you know, archives come up, you can go, oh, you know, because even with the Brazil archives burning down, or museum, I mean, that was just terrible. But the only good thing to come out of that, and believe me, there isn't much, is that people go, oh, wow, like, stuff was stored there, and they start to understand more how important we are in the preservation part. So I'd be curious to know what others say about this, because we're in a tough profession. Yeah, no, I'm a former archivist, so I know. <laughs> but I think from, from our perspective, um, one of the things that we can do is leverage the public trust in our institutions. I mean, if you look at any opinion poll and ask them what they think of elected politicians anymore, they're down there with used car salesmen. But libraries continue to enjoy, you know, 90% support in the, pop, in the population. And I think one of the things that we have to do, and I know that, uh, that, that the, the intention of this panel was to break down the silos between our various disciplines, mm -hmm. but one of the things that we also have to, one of the big sets of silos that we have to break down is the, is the technological revolution that's occurred over the last few years that basically creates what Eli Pariser has referred to as the filter bubble, where people get into these little filter bubbles because the algorithms tell them that this is what they should be looking at. So we have to really make sure that we, we engage the public and show the value that we can um, add to their lives, to their, you know, to that culture is something that is very, very important. The other thing, I think, from, from our perspective, and I see it already happening in some uh, institutions, some of the libraries. For example, if you go to Cambridge, Ontario, uh, it's not called the Cambridge Public Library, it's called the Idea Exchange. What I really like about that is because it, it basically implies that you're not just there to have things thrown at you in terms of ideas, but you're exchanging ideas. It's a community hub. It's where people get together and exchange ideas. And it doesn't preclude other institutions from being in there. So, you know, galleries, libraries, archives, museums, all can interact. And these are where ideas are exchanged. And this is where we can become very, very creative. As a, as, a, as a society. I mean, one of the, uh, the, the other one I like right now with our, our, our um, the OLA, I mean, the, the slogan for the next couple of years is going to be, a visit will get you thinking. And the more we can expose them to other institutions like archival collections, like museum collections, like galleries, I think the better off we'll be. Sorry, just before I pass over the mic to Mike. Michael, um, if anyone does have any questions or something that they wish to end up adding in, like I said, uh, I, we do hope to end up having some more like engagement from the audience. Exchange so, ideas. And exchange ideas, exactly. So, sorry, go ahead, Michael. So, uh, one of the, and I think relates again to archives and libraries in, in the fact that I, I hear far too often, and even on my current board, they'll go, well, the word museum, that's boring. Or, oh, it's just a repository. Um, meanwhile, we're far more than that. We've, we become that we are community hubs. We are uh, really a, I mean, we have 75 volunteers and we're in a small town. So we are definitely a, a community hub. And, and I think with these cr growing ideas of partnering with the other groups, you become even more and more recognized and hopefully take away that stigma of boredom. Um, I, I guess an example is that we do more um, frequent changes of programming where it's every three months we have a new exhibition and generally we focus on the exhibitions being contemporary textile art exhibitions that kind of marry our history exhibition um, so that it really does attract different audiences to come but then also having innovative other partnerships outside libraries and archives where we're actually engaging 
other businesses that are new or other um, intriguing uh, places like um, a store in Ottawa that sells fashion. Well, now he's coming annually and doing a fashion show fundraiser for the museum. So it's looking at how can you engage, but it relates to the history of the organization and brings new people in. So one of the other challenges that we, that once again, all these things are very much linked, I think, all these ideas in terms of, um, and challenges that we end up facing. Um, lifelong learning seems to be one of those big, big questions, which is linked, in fact, to image. It's, it is linked to how to collaborate and how one ends up going about doing that. And we, the problem is, is that we really don't have an easy solution on how to go about doing the, to be able to uh, both explain, but also, um, well, articulate the the whole idea of lifelong learning and what, how exactly do we do we show that that's what's actually occurring? There's a fairly interesting project that was out of the UK that tried to articulate that and tried to quantify it, and they basically concluded that as part of that was that they were having real problems actually being able to do it and that was the point of the project itself um, that the actual impact we we can't explain how exactly we go about doing it um, and for your own institutions I think this is fairly important especially in light of and that was one of the conclusions also is that we need to actually be able to articulate that as GLAMS um, that if we want to end up having access to funding, if we want to have access to the public, um, we need to be able to end up articulating how exactly uh, our institutions are life learning and being able to quantify it, more importantly, to be able to end up demonstrating it. Um, so, I, and I would say this is probably one of the more challenging questions for you guys as panelists, and uh, my apologies, other than it, it has to be asked. So, um, how do GLAMs demonstrate that they can provide lifelong learning spaces to the public and funders? How does your sector achieve this now, and how, do, how can they collaborate on projects to achieve the end result? Yeah, so again, it, it, it was a really interesting question. I, I really had to sit and think because again, as archivists, we, we tend to go into the dark, right? Because we want to protect our materials. And now, we will do exhibits. Um, so if you go to the Archives of Ontario, you know, walk in there, you'll see exhibits at uh, different times. Um, and also we do online, I think more so, because then you know, if we can if we can digitize something, everybody can take a look at it. Um, whereas if it's really fragile, we may not allow the public to actually um, touch it. So for us, it's probably online is easier for us. And I know with Archeon, you know, there's a ton of digital objects in there, and um, you know anybody can come to it. You know, any time of day. Um, so I think our lifelong learning spaces are different, just because we're different. Like if you think about it, with a museum, because I've worked in museums and libraries as well, in a museum, you all have one object that represents an era, an event, something. But with archivists, we want to collect 20 boxes of stuff, right? We want the context of all those documents. And I know I've, I've driven museum and library people crazy with that, because they're like, how many boxes do you need? But that's what we, we need, whereas in, in libraries, you're working with published material. Uh, whereas we're working with unique, unpublished material and almost everything else. Um, so it's interesting. For us, I think I've seen archives do more exhibits, go out more to the community and, and talk more with the community. Um, some archivists are um, going to schools and saying, here's some really cool stuff. Here's you know information around it. And um, also going out to different communities like the indigenous communities in Ontario and saying, here's a treaty that relates to your to you. Um, here it is. Take a look at it. And people get very excited. So for us, I think it's different. I don't know. I'm, I'm very curious to hear what, what everybody yeah. says today. Because for us, I think it's harder because of who we are. And I think when we partner, when we're part of museums or libraries, it's easier. Because then we kind of piggyback on you. And you can be out there more and, and give us a bit, bit of the light uh, that we need. So yeah, it's an interesting question. 
No, it is a really interesting question. It's one of those ones that presents all kinds of issues. But uh, when I was doing my undergrad at Trent, I, uh, I came to learn the, the motto of the university, which was nunc cognosto ex parta. When I leave here, I'll know how much I don't know. And that became your life mission, right? To just keep making a dent in that. And I think that's one of the things that we have to keep emphasizing. That, and, and was also very fortunate to be at Trent at a time when THB Simons was teaching there. He was the grandfather or father of Canadian studies. And one of the, 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 I think one of the most beautiful titles I've ever seen, when he was making the argument for Canadian studies to be part of a university curriculum, the title of the report was, To Know Ourselves. I think that's inspirational. I think it's one of the things is we, we are all memory institutions. And we have to have that memory, that foundation. And I think when you have people from the museum community, the library community, and the archival community, and the, the gallery community who are passionate about what they do, um, you know, let, them come to the, let them come to those community hubs and really demonstrate the, 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 why it's easy to be passionate about that. But I think just you know, the message that should be united from all of us is that all of our institutions will help us develop a better understanding of who we are. And um, if you can do that and if you can get that message across, I think you'll, you'll set the path for people to just want to continue to grow. And I'll just, one last thing, I mean, and it's running counter to the prevailing ethos right now. Um, and I, I don't want to get political, but I mean, for a lot of people, lifelong learning means you, you build, basically develop your skills for your job, period. And that's, you know, we know that as cultural institutions, as, as memory institutions, life ain't worth living if you don't have this stuff. You need the culture, you need the memory, you need the joy. Well, and I think, uh, uh, again, museums have, uh, and, and along with archives and libraries, have a really good opportunity with regard to, to lifelong learning. Um, we can definitely relate the histories of our organizations with current issues. And I think that can definitely make your organization more current and more um, not the stuffy museum. So looking at what is going on in the world, how can we interpret it, how can we have the discussions? Um, so I find there's some really good opportunities um, in that regard, and I think an example, I guess, of a lifelong learn or a learning experience from this past summer, we, had, uh, we hosted an exhibition of puppets. And it was interesting because it was actually showcasing someone in our community, Noreen Young, who is an international puppet maker. And so we, show, we did a retrospective of her work. And every weekend throughout the summer, we had workshops. They, the ones that were full were the adult workshops, not the children's workshops. And the amount that they gained of positive, fun, happy, it was great. And I found that each person that walked out of those different workshops of making puppets or manipulating puppets or whatever the workshop was, they came out happy and were in a world of such high stress and high demand that having that break and having that in a great setting like a museum or a library or an archives, break away from the norms, have fun with it. Okay, I'm just gonna open up to the floor. Does anyone else have any, yeah. Thank you. Is this working? Yeah. Um, I'm, my name is Fred McGarry. I am a founder of Driftscape. Uh, there's an article on Driftscape in Heritage Matters and a card in the bags. Uh, I have, uh, what we're doing, I'm working with the Coburn Lodge in Toronto as one example. Um, that is an institution which has a collection of drawings by Howard, who is an architect in Toronto. Many of the drawings have resulted in buildings that stand in Toronto. So what we'd like to do on Driftscape is take those uh, low resolution versions of those drawings and put them on the landscape on the platform so that you can encounter that, those original artifacts in, in situ. The idea being that as you see more of these around the city on Driftscape, you'll be drawn back to the Coburn Lodge to see the originals. And I, that, that's a way of, of doing all at once. And it's also a collaboration, so we're looking at a a, a private, public private partnership to accomplish that kind of thing. That's only one example of thousands we're working on. Uh, so, so there's a challenge. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello. I'm Marty Brent, and I'm with the Peel Art Gallery Museum and Archive. 
And I think in support of uh, what we're trying to do across institutions, there are um, a number of growing um, initiatives across the country where there um, are they are integrated institutions that house distinct museums, art galleries, and archives in one in one facility. What we've learned from the um, uh, the experience over the last seven years as we've integrated is that we bring incredible skills and specialties, but we also have. Uh, the um, the wonderful um, uh, um, uh, critical mass of a whole variety of collections and when we create exhibitions and develop programs and work with our library partners um, we have a very rich unique um, uh, amalgamation um, together that we respect the unique um, specialties in each of the disciplines, but we are a, a, a fabulous um, collective together, and we're greater um, together than we are individually. And that's probably the best lesson that we can look at in our communities, that when we do share, open up and, um, and bridge between our various disciplines, we, we offer our communities uh, such a rich, uh, a rich realm to uh, uh, to participate in. Sorry, just up here or, or back there. Hi, I'm uh, Adrian Carter. I'm uh, cultural tourism. I represent the regional tourism uh, for Hamilton, Halton, and Brandt. And it is uh, my job to actually market what museums and galleries do. So when you talk about collaborating, I would like to see you collaborate with your local brewery, your local restaurant, your hotel, right? So it's not just collaborating between the library and the museum, but it's actually getting people to come to your site and experience those things. What people want in tourism now is exactly what you have to sell, and that is immersive experiences. And that's really, that will put the bread on your put the butter on your bread, right? It's going to pay the bills. And uh, so I would really encourage you to think about tourism when you develop your programs and your activities. I think we had one more person up here at the front. Oh. Okay. Uh, my name is Lori Webb. I'm the manager of museums and archives for the County of Lambton. Um, and in our division, we also have the Lambton County Library System. So one thing that we are doing with a recent restructuring um, is we are the County Museum is located in the northern tip of Lambton County, um, and to get to the southern end of Lambton County is an hour and a half driving. Um, so trying to get people from Sarnia, the largest municipality in the county, to Lambton Heritage Museum is a challenge, um, and other parts of the county as well because of the geography. Um, so we are looking in the next little while to be leveraging the 26 library branches that are in the county to get our collections out of the museum and into the communities where the materials actually came from. Um, so we're working with the libraries to move in that direction in order to make sure that people are experiencing history in their communities. And then um, one of the things that has come up in the last year or two is the city of Sarnia does not actually have a museum. Um, the county functions as the museum for the city, but again, it's 45 minutes outside of the city. So um, they're looking at doing a renovation of the largest library branch in the city. And as part of that, they're incorporating space for us to have um, historic and museum materials on display in the library space um, right in downtown Sarnia instead of having to build a standalone museum. Um, so we'll be working with them to bring the city's history that's currently outside the city back into the city. So um, that's kind of where we're heading in Lambton. And I think there's one more person there at the back as well. Thank you, you're getting your exercise today. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jess and I work at the County Museums in Prince Edward County. I don't know if any of you have been there before, uh, but it's really a, a trendy spot to be right now. I'm definitely not cool enough to live there, but that's okay. Um, and I appreciated the lady who works for the RTO. Where are you? 
hi. <laughs> I appreciated what you had to say as well because uh, we find that in an area where we live with so many wineries and breweries and art studios um, and just creators generally, that we as museums and our local library and archives, which is a, a combined unit, um, we are, we, we do struggle because the museums are municipally run and that's both a blessing and a curse in so many ways. Um, but it's how do we jump on board? How do we jump on that ship and take advantage of all of those places that basically sell themselves and how do we go along with them? But I, I found it was interesting, Lisa, when you were saying about being in the dark, <laughs> because our local archivist is just <laughs> like the sunniest person that I know, and she is the most outspoken person that I know, and she's very much out in the community. Um, and we're partnering with her, actually. We, uh, for Ontario Heritage Week in February, we do like a week-long, uh, you know, programming not just at the museums but partnering with local organizations like a brewery and the archives is partnering with a distillery actually so they're going to bring in a speaker um, is anyone here a spiritualist I don't know show of hands um, so spiritualism obviously at the turn of the century was really really popular and the Fox sisters and you know knocking and spirits and all of that um, and they were from Prince Edward County before they moved to New York so we're going to tie into that and get a, an expert on spiritualism to come in and really in terms of what it has to do with the archives I mean the connection's a bit tenuous of course there are materials there that refer to the Fox sisters but it's more like how can we get people into our sites um, where the connection is still present it's still it's like we want to give them something meaningful and something related to our local heritage, but it doesn't necessarily have to be them dealing with our um, delicate materials. But at the same time, then they're going to have a spirit tasting. So they're going to have something delicious to do while they're there. And throughout this entire day, I just keep hearing experiential and immersive and these words that are super buzzwords right now. And I just think we're all moving in the right direction. I think it's going to be great. So just good luck, everybody. And, and I just want to say that for archivists, like it's great when we can partner with, with libraries and museums, because like I say, it gives us more uh, it, it gives us more of a reason to get out there and, and be able to partner. So the partnerships that I've heard about are awesome. And, and it, it, it benefits us really a lot because we can do more, because you guys can do more, and you know we can all do more together. So the partnerships are great when we can do them. Um, it's just when people want to view our fragile materials. And, and we're trying to digitize as much as we can, but of course the there's nothing like the original material, right? So it's great to hear about all these uh, collaborations, and they are out there. Ontario archivists in particular are really gung-ho, even though, yes, a lot of us do work in dark spaces. Um, <laughs> we're, we're pretty cool people, and, and pretty funny too. But, um, but we enjoy the collaboration, so it really helps. Sorry, this person. Hi, uh, for those of you that don't me know me, my name's Lindsay Kernahan and I'm the curator at Museum Strathroyd Caradoc. So we're a museum with an archive that's located inside of a public library. So this collaboration is really just our daily existence and I think it's becoming more of the norm. And as this is becoming more of the norm, I'd be really interested in hearing about how the glam sector as a whole can prepare its workers for this new future because as an emerging professional, to be a member of the Museum Association, the Archive Association, the Library Association, and then also the Art Gallery Association that's not represented here today, it's financially not feasible, right? So I would be really interested in hearing more about how the glam sector as a whole can prepare and support its workers in moving forward in these new collaborations. I'm going to let uh, one of you want to one of you. Well, I think, again, one of the things that we can start doing at the provincial level is having those conversations amongst the various disciplines to talk about standards, to talk about um, making sure that, um, especially when it comes to uh, receiving public funds, that we're not doing a race to the bottom. 
but also just to make sure that the professional standards of museums, libraries, galleries, archives are all maintained in those um, facilities and to emphasize that to the people who are backing us up. But, you know, this is the, these initiatives are relatively new and I think at the provincial level we need to start having regular dialogues amongst the, the various organizations to make sure that we can provide some guidance to uh, local institutions. And I think that's the starting point, but yeah, uh, you're right. It, this thing, and, and I think that the thing that, the message that I'll be taking back to my organization is that these things are happening regardless. You know, uh, so why don't we start embracing it and seeing what we can do to maximize the, uh, the potential. And one other thing that's happening is that um, like associations are starting to talk to each other to see if they can give, you know, a deal on the on the conference registration. So if you're a member of this, you can at least get a, a member right. And it, it's small, but it, it's helping a little bit. Yeah, go I, ahead. I think another aspect to it is also that uh, the OMA could work more with um, the archives and the library associations to also get it out there to the granting agencies that these kind of partnerships could be of great benefit to help the organizations moving forward. I think it's, it's interesting because a prime example a few years back I, when I did apply for funding and I got the funding for this uh, Gazette digitization project, uh, we got funding for I think it was three or four years in a row, but then another museum, just a city, a town over from us, wanted to do the same project and I went to apply and they said, no, you can't partner with your library. So it was very interesting why that change happened because I had no problem partnering with my library, but for some reason they couldn't. So it's getting that awareness out through the association to also the granting agencies about how important it is that we do these partnerships and that we collaborate and how important that is. And it surprises me because most grants actually want more and more partners um, in order to apply. So I'm not sure what the rationale behind that one was, but uh, definitely that's another initiative that could be undertaken. I kind of like this as a way of, of wrapping up because in fact as a, um, I think it, it's a perfect example why this panel actually came about, going back to the beginning here, it was because I was allowed to end up going in and sit in on a workshop on doing things with archivists and while I was volunteering at a museum and being able to end up going in and uh, Lisa was great to be able to end up inviting us and to be able to say yeah absolutely you can end up showing up and it's like and it was just even accommodating when I was in the room okay so yeah you're using this terminology and I think by the end of the workshop we actually dropped some of that terminology and we realized this is ridiculous like we're talking the same language just say one of the two and we we actually all get it so I think uh, it's doing things like that that really helps build on it and if we can end up doing more of that in the future I think that uh, we have a much uh, much brighter um, future so I'm going to, on that note, I think that's the end of our, our talk. So thank you so much for uh, participating in, and thank you so much for our panelists. Uh, my name is Liz Driver and I'm the director curator of Campbell House Museum in downtown Toronto and on the program committee. And uh, I get to present the uh, presence to the panel, and I think there is board there. Um, one thing that really stood out for me, while well, it always does, and this panel really underscored it, is the crucial value to society of the of glam, the glam sector, um, the mem as memory institutions, and um, I, I think just the the unity of purpose, I guess, um, that comes across from people who work uh, in galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. And uh, I have to thank you, Kevin, for uh, structuring and setting out the, the, the questions. And um, it's incredible how much you drew out through the conversation, um, different uh, elements and challenges and issues. Uh, and I think it's a perfect setup for the plenary session on GLAMS that is going to follow uh, in this room uh, next after we have our break. So um, thank you and a round of applause again for the participation.